hold on one second. All right, we're live, brother. Right on. How you doing? Doing good. Doing awesome. I like awesome. the uh, like. Looks like you're up in the woods as well. I am. I am. We're both in the woods right now. Um, I just have a really cool yeah, wood background. I don't. I'm. I'm. I'm at home. <laughs> I I, well, I figured. I figured you're on a green screen. Yeah, I tried to change the background, but then it wants me to. You know, your system here wants me to either log in or sign up. I'm like, I ain't got time. Yeah, no, it's all good. It's all, I like I like your background, and uh, I was trying to get us facing more of the the woods, but it um, the the sun is like right. So I had to get a little bit of shade on me, or else I was going to be super bright. But Aaron, so I'm here with Aaron Chapman. Uh, you're a branch manager at Security National Mortgage. You're an author of several books, and we're going to talk about the titles in just a second. Um, you're launching this amazing adventure podcast, and we'll talk a little bit about that and what you're doing from a YouTube perspective, but you've also seen like this insane amount of success with mortgages. I mean, you're funding about hundred to 120 loans per month, mm -hmm. and it's all from primarily focusing on investors. So when you talk about like ni a niche business, you know, you, a lot of loan officers don't want to be pigeonholed in one sort of business, but you've just said, you know what, I'm going to be, I'm going to double down on investors. And, um, and it's really played out very, very well for you. So I want to start off, Aaron, and thank you. I really appreciate you joining us today because I know if you're funding a hundred loans and it's month end, um, uh, when you hang up with me, you're going to have about a, I don't care how, how great your process is. You're going to have about 20 calls you got to make um when we hang well, up so fun, thank you for joining us vibrating like crazy as it is right now man <laughs> so this is awesome so okay so first off i want to talk about the books because um i you know what's crazy is when you and i did the podcast i went on when we were literally i think when we were actually doing the podcast and i couldn't order them like i went in and ordered on amazon and they were legit sold out so I want to talk, and so I want to talk a little bit about that and how you got into the the you know deciding on the names of the books, number one, and then how you ended up writing the book. So tell me a little bit about that and what what that's been like. So how it started? Well, one, thank you. I appreciate you letting me come on and do the live thing with you because you know, it's one thing to do a podcast where you can edit it; it's another thing to put things <laughs> like me on here live. So we're live, you, brother. You give me a good one, or people are gonna be shutting this shit off real fast. So. <laughs> The, the book situation, it really just, I never thought to become a writer or an author in any sort. I just started hammering out thoughts. One day, some things were running around in my head. So I started punching some stuff down on this mm -hmm. Samsung 10.1 tablet I had back in 2012. And it turned into just something that grew to like 370 pages. Well, then after wow. having all of that, I uh, decide what am I going to do with it? Because it was really just thoughts to give to my kids. I wanted them to have something to refer back to because I've had, a, it, even though in a short life, I've experienced a lot of stuff in a short window of time just because I've always been you know, active in something. Mm -hmm. well, and uh, in, in trying to decide what to do, I was at this event where somebody was talking about being an author. So I asked him, you know, how do you go about that? And he gave me the name of somebody who was actually Tony Robbins' assistant for like eight years. Oh, and nice. She, She's written a lot of books. So I connected with her. And what was cool was when I called the number, she answered and she's like, and we got to talking. She goes, I just tell you, she goes, I never answer this phone. She goes, I have oh, wow. to do that. She goes, for me to pick this up when you're on this, she goes, there's something we're going to do that's going to be cool. So I went from there. I sent them the manuscript and she and her number one person on her team read it and they got, came back to me. And they said, Hey, you got, you sitting down. I'm like, yeah. They said, um, let me just tell you, we read it. The content's good, but nobody gives a shit. It's like, you need to write something people are going to care about before they will care about this. I'm like, well, oh, what yeah. the hell is that? They said, well, tell us your story. So you start sharing things with them. And then it got to a point where I ended up going out to the uh, a lake house in Olympia, Washington, sitting in the lake house with her and just knocking out two days of verbal and then they tried to do a um, kind of like a ghostwriter thing and it didn't work out. I didn't like it. And in traveling with my uh, my I was traveling out. I don't know where I was going to do. I, was, I, I got one point two million miles in my when I'm executive platinum of American uh, American Airlines. So I'm constantly traveling before covid. And at one of the stops I was in the Admirals Club in Dallas. And I was talking to my brother in law. He goes, dude, you should come up with different books that cover different topics. 
I'm like, yep. dude, my book already covers different topics. What the problem is, is I don't go, it wasn't going real deep in them. I was just touching on the topics, trying to blend it all together. I'm like, hell with this. I'm going to do what he just said. I'm going to take every chapter. I'm going to break it down to the depth of that topic. And then I'm going to wrap that chapter with a cover and ship it out. So, and I got to thinking, I'll do no more than 30 pages. And if I can't get it, all my thoughts down in 30 pages on that topic, then I ain't doing my job. So yeah. that, that's really kind of how it all came about. And that's why I decided to break the book into, into 13 chapters, 13 individual things and dive real deep into the subjects. And you can't blend them together. They all have their own independent book in reality. Well, so, but that's what, that's what makes it really cool, right? Because there's a couple of things that you said there that I want to jump in on. So the first one is we talk about micro content, right? And like, if you think about like you and I did a full podcast, which by the way, is available on Apple and Spotify. Um, and I'll, and I'll actually drop the link in, in the comments um, at the end of this. But when, when you do, when you do content like that and you have a really good story to tell, then you can pull micro content on it. And that's basically what you did with this book. You had this, in, you know, this full book, right. And then you broke it down into 13 chapters, which makes that micro content so much easier to digest and so much easier to, you know, get people to want to engage in it. Um, so I definitely believe, especially in a time where our, t our attention span is far, you know, less greater than it's ever been. Um, having smaller books, you know, make to me just makes all the sense in the world. But then you said something else that really, um, that really resonated with me, you know, and it's about building content in a way that your kids can see your story later. And that's really the purpose of, I think a lot of it is like, you know, how cool would it be if you could see your grandfather or your great grandfather hustling and, and pitching what they were pitching, whatever it was that they were doing for their lives at the time, you know, a hundred years from now, right? I mean, that would be something really amazing. And so that the fact that you're creating content in, in this world and putting it out there for your children, I think is, is just by far so awesome. So how, well, how, what, let's talk about the name. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I mean, we all, we all are interested in our DNA and what makes us who we are. You know, yep. I get to hear, I, I used to hear a lot of cool stories about my, my great grandfather and some stuff that he mm -hmm. did actually a few uh, generations back as well. And then my my great aunt um, got really caught up in genealogy, and I have a working copy in my safe. I've got a a, a um, pedigree chart from my family, the Chapman side, going all the way back to Adam and Eve. It's twenty seven feet long and three feet wide. Oh wow! It is that big? It's ridiculous. Yeah, and you get to see a lot of cool stuff, but I I don't know much about a lot of the names on there. I didn't want to, you know, when I I know when I leave this earth, I want to be able to at least leave something as a, yeah. um, a, a kind of a placeholder of what I learned, where did I get my ass kicked? How did I get back up and overcome that and move move forward and continue to keep going forward? So hopefully can they garner something from that to make their life a little bit better, I hope, and not have to have the scars that I've gotten. I got a ton of them. Well, I mean, I, I agree, but that's a storytelling as well. Like you, one, you have a gift of storytelling, right? You know how to do that, probably just inherently. Um, you do it well. And so to be able to have that in the world is 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 super awesome. So tell me about how you came up with the names for your book. So give me a few of the names of, of, of the books and the chapters that you have that are really eye-catching. Well, I got to tell you something funny too. So um, when I try to buy your books and I couldn't buy them, they stayed in my cart um, for um, for my Amazon account. And so my wife and I share the account. So my wife's like, what, what are you buying? <laughs> and so we got to talk a little bit about the names of your books and, and how they're grabbing attention. So first one, book one is basically it's it's a write up of when I decided because I was working my ass off to try and break, you know, when I was getting past 300 loans in 2016. And yep. I sat down and I had just closed on some property in the northern Ozarks of, uh, of uh, Arkansas. It, that's a whole other story that I could tell and that could take could take an hour. Well, and so I put myself and I believe from something I learned as being interviewed by Summit Funding years ago about writing down your future, right? And I was yep. accomplishing things that I'd written several years before with, with their encouragement, which was awesome. I, what I do is I put myself in, in the future tense and I write myself a letter of what happened in the past so that I'm painting that picture of already experiencing it. So what I did, I wanted to break 600 loans in 2017. So what I did is I put myself in the Ozark Mountains, sitting on my porch, 
in my rocking chair way in the future thinking back on 2017 and I'm writing this out, right? I'm writing those things out and those 600 transactions that I funded in 2017, I put this whole vision out of, of my morning in the future. Well, then yep. a few, you know, so what ended up happening is some things happened that we, you know, we lost the brick and mortar in the, in the state of Missouri. Uh, my you know, uh, regional manager calls me and say, Hey, how important is that state to you? I'm like, well, I got 12% of my business. And so it's pretty important. And it worked out that within two months and two days later, I closed on property re to replace the office that we lost. It happened to be two cabins built in the 1800s in the Ozarks. I was in the northern Ozarks of southern Missouri. I found mm -hmm. myself going back to meet the contractor. My wife and my sister had conspired together to have a rocking chair waiting for me on the porch of one of those cabins when I got there. <laughs> How so awesome when, is that? When I walked up and I stepped, looked over there, and there's a ton of the story. It's all in the book. There's a lot more of the story. But when I walked there and I looked over and there is a rocking chair sitting on my porch, it didn't quite hit me. I ran over and I sat down. I started rocking. Then it hit me. I pulled out my notepad. And two months and two days before, I had written down, I was sitting in my rocking chair on my porch overlooking the Ozark Mountain landscape. And I happened to be in the Ozarks of Southern Missouri, even though in my mind when I was writing it, I was in Arkansas. So like, and the, the way that it happened was just crazy. Now, that same year, not only did I have the porch, the yep. Ozarks, the rocking chair, but I ended up closing 686 transactions that year. Oh, and yeah. It was not easy. It was a feet and a half. My team came together and kicked ass in some really, really tough circumstances. And so to have accomplished all those things, um, it was really amazing. So I wrote that story down. And that was part of what I was trying to push into the book itself that they wanted me to do. And when I wrapped that chapter up, it was easy for me to say, you got to point your head, your heart and your ass will follow. And so <laughs> when I find that book, I always tell people, you got to think it, you got to believe it. So that's your head and your heart in there. Mm -hmm. You got to write it. And then you got to move your ass. Your ass just doesn't follow going and finding the churn plan to get in there. You've got to actually chase whatever it is you wrote down. And we did. Yep. And it was not easy going from 300 loans in 2016, it's like 320 or something like that, to 686. You don't go to that without purpose. And we had to work our butts mm -hmm. off. It was it was a very tough year. There's a lot of things that, hell, I probably, I, I was on the verge of getting shit canned from Security National the way we were, because some of the stuff that was happening, but we dug in and we made it work. And it was the greatest strengthener to my team to where we have come together in as a unit that I can step away for a couple hours and mm -hmm. I come back, stuff just handled. They're, they're doing an amazing oh, yeah. job. That's amazing. I mean, and that that goes to say that that also is a lot of your leadership that's coming in, you know, as well. We talked about that on the full podcast and really how you have given, you know, you pick the right team, you're giving them the ability. Um, everyone knows the, the everybody's on the same page with the same goals. And now everybody knows, you know, which direction they're going on. And, you know, it's a testament, right? Like every year you probably are, um, are changing something up with respect to how you lead. Um, so how, how many people do you have on your team now? I want to say you said like last time, like a, in the twenties, uh, 26 right now. Wow, dude. Yeah. And then how many deals do you think you'll fund in 2020? And I don't want to jinx you or anything, but, but how many deals I, are, I are you? Are, are you? We're, we're approaching 800 right now. So we're going to fund, I'm, I'm aiming 1200, 1200 loans. So, this is this is amazing, right? Because for the, for any of you who hasn't seen the micro content that I'm building, uh, you know, you and I talked a lot about how you didn't want to conform to the way that you know the industry was telling us that we had to conform. And when you kind of shed all of those things, you you know you you got the trucker's hat, you put on your your what did you say? Were they lit? Were they lizard skin boots? Uh, I got their their alligator. If I was more flexible, alligator, there you go. I, would, I would let you see him if I was flexible enough. <laughs> so you got your alligator. What what's the brand on now? Are you got you got some Luke Casey's on? What do you what do you wear? Oh, no, these are custom made. Uh, they're, no, they're, they're, see, of course they are, Aaron. God damn it! Of course they are. <laughs> oh yeah, those they're, are their motorcycle boots, right? So um, yeah, you know, there's just jeans, and I wear a Dickies Dickies shirt, right? Because they're the most durable damn yeah. the Dickies work shirts. I actually catch hell from the buddy of mine. He's um. His name's Joel. He and his partner own Realty Executives here in Phoenix, and he busts my chops all the time. He's like, and he's also on the initiative that we're doing the YouTube channel. He's like, dude, you are a thirty-five dollars shirt, 
you got, he goes, I don't know how many thousands of dollars you got in boots and how many thousands of dollars you got in that watch. He goes, but he goes, you were the weirdest some bitch ever met. He goes, that's what makes you work. <laughs> I love it. So let me check out what, what, what kind of watch you sporting. You got a, is that a, a Panerai? Today, no, I do Omega. Oh man, I love the Omegas, man. That's a nice, that's a nice, nice watch. So uh, no, Aaron, you know, let's talk about this, uh, what you're doing with YouTube and, you know, because I think you have an amazing story, um, not only on why you're doing it and how you're telling it, but it sounds like a production nightmare and you're, you're pulling this off, dude. So talk, let's talk about it. It is a nightmare. So what it was is since the books came about, right? I'm like, okay, yep. how do I spin off of that? Cause you know, I've got four of them out and these first four, I'll just hit real quick through the titles is um, the second book is the uh, gratitude of practical application. It is built to explain two contrasting accounts within one week that um, it really shows that gratitude and the exercise of it is an economy, it creates an economy. It's not just some feeling. It's not this mystical thing between you and God, or if you do it right, God's going to send out the gratitude pinata and rain blessings on you. It doesn't work that way. You know, the other is um, the third one, quit jerking off. I mean, it's <laughs> in every sense of the word, right? So it's you're wasting time. On every people. sense of the word. And it's the truth because people spend so, they get caught up in, in, in it's just, you know, it's crazy what people I feel will, you. Will, I feel will, you. and run with somebody. In fact, um, well, read the damn book. You'll understand why I put yeah. that together like that. And then the last one is Steel Running, and it has to do with the steel chainsaw thing and why steel I wear the hat. Steel, yeah. And it's got a picture of my dad standing on front of it holding this, this chainsaw from the 1960s. It was the first saw he ever bought, and I now have it in my shop. And uh, that thing still runs. It's never been rebuilt. It's just been just been tuned up. That's it. That some bitch still runs. And that's the point is that you've got to be the type and you've got to be also everything that you purchase, everything that you do. You've got to be that that will continue to be reliable. You know, reliability is what we're lacking a lot of in the in the world today. And so, you know, in my in my opinion, the steel chainsaw is the absolute the greatest, most powerful, coolest hand tool ever created. But it's also the most dangerous. You misuse it for a second, it will kill you. People have lost their life just doing a remedial job and getting themselves and getting a, getting out of their uh, out of their control. So the reason I wear the hat is because it reminds me every single day that the the most elegant, most useful, and most powerful tool ever known to man is the human mind. But it's also the most dangerous. If we misuse it for a moment, it will kill you. It will destroy you. It will completely uh, uh, eliminate any potential for growth. So people have to be very conscious about where they're letting their their thoughts wander on a minute by minute basis and be purposeful with their thoughts. And so when this goes in my head, it makes me purposeful. It reminds me every single day. So nobody gives me any shit you know, when I go to go to meetings while I'm si I'm sitting in the boardroom of the company with a steel chainsaw hat. I had the I, CEO, I the, you. I, CEO of the company asking me about the beard. He's like, so tell me about this because it's a little bit weird. And I explained where it came from. Right. I woke up in the hospital with a beard right and so i left yeah. it and learned how to walk again and nobody gives me shit about that either right so it's 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 what aaron chapman is so now building those books out having that it's okay so it's one thing to have the books it's another thing to talk about the depth of why i why, why they exist and what i think the world needs to be doing with these ideas not that because they're my ideas they're not my i mean these are these are ages old these ideas have been around forever read your bible it's all in there right um, and so I thought, well, it, there's a lot of great content out there. There's a lot of people that are doing what you're doing, you know, bringing people on, talking about some really good information to disseminate to the world. And I've been, a, I've been a guest on over a hundred podcasts. I've been asked when I'm going to start mine. I got to thinking, I don't want to do a podcast. I want to do something different. So I thought, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get together with the people I want to get together with. And I'm going to take them out to places like this, where we're going to go four wheeling, long range shooting, bow fishing, fly fishing, really cool stuff. Spend a day getting to know this person and then have that real deep conversation around the fire at night. And so it is a production nightmare. Uh, the first one that I did, I did with uh, my buddy, Joel, the one I mentioned earlier owns Realty Execs, my buddy Floyd, mm -hmm. who owns uh, Empire Services West. It's a um, commercial construction company and restoration company. Mm -hmm. uh, another buddy of mine, Clint, who is uh, who you know, works um, for AutoNation, and runs their shops. And then of course, Chloe, uh, Chloe, my camera girl. And then, um, and this guy, Chris, who's running the cameras. And then I've got my daughters work for me. They're out there cooking and running stuff for us. So it's, it's a full, it's so awesome. And I got, I mean, it's expensive to run, but 
Well, it's me goofing off anyway. I get to write it off, and now I get to give good content. I pray it's good content, and we've got one episode out. The problem with it is, is the logistics of, you know, cutting this stuff up and releasing it is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. But oh, once dude, so like what I do, what I do is not on the level that you're doing it on. Like, I mean, I, I get in an office, right, and I'm doing it like this. You got a camera crew. And, you know, there's light. I mean, how do you get good lighting around a fire pit? You know, so you like all those things you got to think about and it's nuts, but I can't wait to see it, dude. This is going to be, and I, and by the way, I'm all in when you're ready to do this, man, because oh, I, yeah, I, I would be super coming. stoked to do this with you. You're definitely coming down that because I love to sit and just have that chat with you. Just shoot the shit about, about life. And, and it's amazing what you get out of people when the, the guard is down and they've spent the time with you. But like you said, mm -hmm. the lighting is tough. You know, we get the battery operated stuff. I got generators. You can see a generator on this side, you know, attached to the trailer. I've got all that stuff and stuff doesn't work. Right. So, you know, camera, you know, lights go down, cameras go down. You're, you're oh, yeah. doubling down on everything. We have double everything. everything in the air. I got two, two sets of cameras. I got, I said, what I got, I think I have five cameras. This stuff ain't cheap. Wow. You know, people ran the cameras. It's, 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 uh, it's something. And if it, and here's the way I see it. If it all goes to shit, who cares? It's a cool story. You have the life experiences and the stories to tell. And exactly. so, yeah. And by the way, it makes doing what we do fun when you start to do the marketing around it and, and everything. Um, you know, I got to go back to something you said because I didn't want it to pass. And, and I only have you for another 10 minutes. But, you know, the personification, oh, you know, like this is what I love about. Okay. Well, I, one of the things I loved about what you, how you not only tell a story, but also how you're, you've branded yourself. And, and I want to take a quick, quick example. And this is where like, everybody's always asking themselves, do I have a story? Do I have a brand? Right. And, and think about it because what you did is you personify the chainsaw and, and aligned it with the mind, right. And how, how the most simplistic tool could also, you know, crush you, right. It could also, it could also kill you. And it's the same as your mind, right? And and but also the fact that you you still carry the chainsaw, you still have the chainsaw from your grandfather. And as a father or grandfather? My father. Your father. And and you've now branded not only, you know, the hat that you wear every day that you'll sit in the boardroom with, but you also named your book still running, which is also the personification of the chainsaw that still works. You know, after all these years, it just miraculously just fires up whenever you do it. And that to me is the essence of simplistic marketing that everyone within them has a similar story that they just need to bring out. And and I love what you're doing on this. I mean, I couldn't tell you enough on, on how much I appreciate you, you sharing that story because we all have that in us and everybody's trying to search for how do I brand myself? And, and you just got to look deep within to find those stories. And, and I love what you did with that personification. That was, that was amazing. Um, so tell us how, how you're, you know, what you're going to do from, from, you know, now to the end of the year with the podcast and the YouTube, um, how many more episodes do you think you'll be able to shoot between now and then? So I'm going to be able to shoot another one, two, three, eight, another 12. By another 12. Yeah. Wow. So every time we go out, we make sure that there's at least four people with us that we're going to have that conversation with. Oh, okay. Good. good. So yeah. we have enough Jeeps, we have enough stuff. So I'm going to be, see here, at the end of this next this next month, I'm going to be in uh, Northern Missouri on Adam Venetary's ranch hunting with him. Uh, we're mm -hmm. going to get some time with him, hopefully around the fire to have a conversation. We're going to we're going to have some people coming into Arizona for two other, uh, two other, shoots if you will and we're gonna have different different mm -hmm. folks in there to uh to interview and it's just i think the it's the logistics of getting it released is the thing that's kind of the pain in the ass right now because i think we kind of got it figured out how to get get it done get it the content but get it now cut up and released is the tougher part um and then you know as far as the the branding thing you know a lot of people are going to still even after this and any other conversation they hear they're still going to ask themselves how they brand themselves especially when you're in an in an environment like the mortgage industry that that tends to tell you where the borders are and you got to stay within those borders so they feel that they, they have a narrow field to walk to brand themselves within this industry mm -hmm. And what it just what the only thing I can offer anyone is just just be so much you that you you they can't tell that it's anybody but you. 
um, too often we try to pick up what somebody else is doing to see if we can put a little spin on it, you know, and I'm, I'm just hoping I'll have some, some bitch walking around with a braided beard and a Barna hat trying to be the, trying to be the, the antithesis of Aaron Chapman. It's just not going to, not going to work guys. You can't, you can't do it that way. You got to look back in your, your heritage, look in your childhood, see what, what drove you to get to this point mm -hmm. and then, then wear it. Wear it on the outside so people can see that what you are on the outside matches the inside. You know, when I first got going in the industry, I had everybody tell me how to look, how to act, how to talk. I was 23 years old. I had to listen to everybody else tell me. And then it wasn't long, and they're all gone. I was left to myself. And I think it's like, well, if that's what it's supposed to be to be successful. Why are these bastards all gone? You know, and then yeah. I started thinking at some point that, you know, I'm just going to do it my damn way because there's nobody here to tell me anyway. Nobody's getting, nobody's, uh, nobody is saying anything about it anymore because they're all gone. And that's where it really started to click. And then I had, I shared the story about Jack and you put that on the clip. Very, very good friend of mine that, that forced me into a choice. And that to me is probably one of the best things that anybody can ever do to you is actually force you to decide. And he forced me to decide with, with the, um, with an amazing offer. And that's when I had to be forced to decide. And to this day, I still give him a ton of credit. There was a time he called me up. He goes, he saw me in the Scotsman guy. He's like, whoa, look what you did. I'm like, dude, you helped me do that. And he goes, how'd I do that? He goes, I didn't do shit for you. And I said, like, yeah, you did. I said, you you made me decide. You actually illuminated that I was not deciding for myself mm -hmm. at the time. I give you tons of credit for that. Love the man to death for being willing to put me to those to that decision. So I'm putting everybody to that decision right now. Figure out who the hell you are. And let the whole world know it. And then don't give a damn if somebody doesn't want to do business with you because of how you look. There's a lot of times I walked into places and they'll turn their head and want something. That means, guess what? I don't have to put up with your shit <laughs> for the next three, four months to try and conform to your crap to just eventually yeah. not do business with you anyway. Yes, I, I totally agree. I totally agree. I mean, that's that's the name of the game, right? I mean, and it's it's an empowering um I've, I've worked with a lot of loan officers and there's always a, a I got a, I, literally a bee like uh, flying around me, but um, there's a, um, there's always a, um, a, a, a changing point that I've seen with loan officers that when they decide that they're going to be who they want to be and they're going to not be uh, driven by their, their referral partners and that they're going to be who they want to be and offer the service that they can serve and not be bullied by, you know, someone else, their business just explodes because when you're new to the game, you want to say yes to everything. Mm -hmm. Yes, I could do it. Yes, I could do it. Yes, I could do it. And when you realize that you don't have to say yes to everything, it's weird how everything changes. Cause not only you and I talked about vulnerability, but not only how, you know, it's okay to be vulnerable to say, I can't do it or I can't meet that expectation. People are like, okay, cool. You know, that usually they'll continue down the path with you. Um, but I have seen cool. a lot of times that they're cool with the expectation if they know what it is. That's it. That's it. But people will push the envelope and it's, and it's in, it's in human nature to, to do that as well, you know? And so um, I want to talk about, you know, before we have to drop a uh -huh, you know, what would you say, Aaron, to, you know, for loan officers that are going to watch this, a lot of them are, are curious, how does a guy do a hundred loans a month? And, you know, specifically with one market, what is your value proposition to investors? Well, for, for as a loan one, officer, it's going to be a few different things. One is, is coming to that decision that I can't be everything to everybody. Cause I figured out that when I tried to be everything to everyone, I become nothing to no one. Nobody cares. <laughs> when there you go. When, you fit every, when you're trying to fit every box. And so, and then I also decided, man, I can't stand, I absolutely cannot stand doing certain types of loans, working with certain types of borrowers and working with certain types of so-called referral sources that, like you said, want to badger the shit out of you, even in the middle of the yeah. night on Sunday, you know, to say, well, when, <laughs> you have docs now. I'm like, it's the middle of freaking night on Sunday. How do I have docs out? Right? And so it's, it's, it's insanity when you're dealing with certain people. And so that's yeah. where I decided that I, I identify with the real estate investor. And then the other thing of it is, is you have to dig deep to understand that it's more than just doing a loan. That's why I tell everybody, say, when they when they ask me what makes you different, I'm like, well, one, if you haven't been to my website, you'll figure that out real damn quick, what makes me different. Secondly, is you know, when it comes to the loan process, large banks have mm -hmm. proven 
take the monkey out of the cage, give it a phone and training, it'll close loans. It's not a hard thing to do if you know your product. I just decided to know that product so damn well that if anybody else claims they're the best at that, I'll take Pepsi Challenge against them all day long. And it's not about the loan. It's about the client. It's about what are they going to get out of that? And I actually create clients out of it. I don't I don't just go out there and try and jockey for and compete for loans. No, mm -hmm. I create more clients. So I create more investors with understanding mindset of the real estate investor, understanding where the real mm -hmm. value of real estate investing is. Somebody wants to tell you interest rate and cash on cash return. I just tell them, go ahead and walk away from that son of a bitch because he has no clue what the hell he's talking about. I get into economics. I get into the data on inflation. I get into where cash flow is the cherry on top of the Sunday. The real yes. value of anything is the leverage of the loan and understanding that. And once I'm done with them, my goal is to tear them down from a consumer spending money and going into debt to now empowering them to become yes. the CEO of a real estate investment firm. And they rely on me to be a member of their board table to give them practical data to make decisions instead of speculation or theory. Yes. The best thing you said right now was it's not about the loan. It's about the individual. Correct. Right. So every investor is different. Every investor has a different need. Every investor has a long-term plan. I may just want to buy one house, right? And you're going to show me how I can buy five because I can leverage financing. And that's the difference, right? How much do you want to scale, Chris? How much do you, and, and to me, you were, you know, you and I went deep on a podcast about that. That's exactly the difference between you and maybe somebody else who's trying to be in the investor game. You have to know what your client wants before you can pitch a loan. Well, that, that's and, everything. And that's for everyone. And a lot of my contemporaries and a lot of the law officers on here, you're going to fall uh, fall trap to sending the client to do the app before you have the conversation with them. You're going to tell them, hey, why don't you go ahead and fill out the app? Let's put your credit and let's decide what we can let me figure, see what we can do before we even talk. Well, that's the mm -hmm. one thing I don't do. I actually catch a lot of crap from my contemporaries saying, why do you waste the time with people you don't even know if they qualify? Like, why would I waste my team <laughs> time if I don't know? That they even want to do business with me i go for the no out of the gate i, I have assistant now i don't use calendly i think calendly is in completely impersonal i have assistant that reads my emails and schedule my calls all the time she personally communicates with that new client i set up an initial call with them if they want to talk they'll talk to me and so when i talk to them i break them down and i shoot for one if you really want this if you're chasing rate we're going to hang up here because that's not what it's about i'm already very very competitive if I wasn't competitive, I'd be, I wouldn't be closing a thousand plus loans. You wouldn't be in a bit. Yeah. So let's put yeah. that aside and just assume I'm right. Now let's go into this. And by the <laughs> time we're done, yes. if by time we're done, um, I have put them in a completely different mindset. And now the, the, the only problem with that on occasion is I've created a monster. Sometimes, sometimes you get a yeah. person like, shit, yeah, I'm going to be super investor. And they go write 10 contracts. They haven't got a prequel yet. Right. Because they, I made them so <laughs> Just power, empowered to go kick ass, and so I have to calm them down. Yeah. So let's just do one, then maybe maybe two. If you got a lot of money, you want to deploy, let's yeah. figure you out first because you all are special snowflakes, and you've created this shit storm in your life that I have to unravel. And you're going to bitch at me that I'm going to ask for a lot of paperwork just for a prequel. But everything you hate to hate to give me, I hate to read. And so when I get that information. We're going to verify well in advance taxes, income, the whole works. That prequal is not just an application, a credit report. It is a deep dive underwrite. And I have actual underwriters do that. I have five underwriters on my team. And two of them take all the prequals and look at them in advance. I do not put a single deal into my process, which is a lot like Chipotle's process building burritos. I put those loans in that same process. And not a single one gets into my process unless, they, unless they've been fully vetted. Fully vetted. Fully by vetted. you. And that's the thing, right? So so as as loan officers grow and you have a manufacturing process with your team, just like anybody else does. But one of the things that I think is really key for you is you still do the personal touch and have the consultation. Um, you know, I, I, I've seen it so often where loan officers get to a certain level that their entire assistants or their entire team now, you know, do the entire loan you're still accessible and you're still being, you're still able to fund a thousand loans in a year. That's amazing. Or, or in 1200. So I think that's the key to your success. But, but again, I'll say it again, it goes back to every client has a need 
And it's not just aligning alone with that with that person. It's understanding what their long term and short term strategies are. And that to me is is, you know, the key to your success. And I appreciate you pointing that out. And that's I believe that's the case, too, is making it so much about that person, that other person on the side of the, the other side of the phone and the other side of the deal. You know, like, like I explained to him, you know, I'm kind of like, you know, kind of like the gold rush of the 1800s. I talk about that a lot. I'll ask you, Chris, I probably asked you before, or maybe you even heard it. Who made the most money during the gold rush? Who? The guys who sold the picks and shovels, you know, and, <laughs> yeah. and it's because everybody needed a pick and a shovel to go out there and dig, but not everybody was successful in the digging. And what I explained to them is like, guys, I'm selling picks and shovels. You're going out there trying to find gold and I'm giving you the tools to find it. But the difference between me and that guy is I care where you put your pick and your shovel into the ground at because I, I do not want you to fail and turn those into gardening tools because if they're gardening tools, it does no good for me or you. But if I can help <laughs> you find the gold and get your mind right as to knowing where it's at and you successfully yep. dig it up. And then you need more picks, more shovels. You'll need personnel, trucks. You're going to need heavy equipment. You'll need a damn train to haul all of it. And if you do, who do you come to? You come to me. Yeah. And if you come to me for all of that, I am so damn wealthy because of your wealth. I absolutely need you to be too successful. If you fail, I start to fail, and I will not participate mm -hmm. in failure. So you better be ready to get on the train and start working with me because if you're not, go to somebody else who's just going to jerk you off because I ain't got the time. <laughs> you know, the best quote is I will not participate in failure. So, you know, I started doing these um, these graphics with quotes that, that people have pointed out that I've said in podcasts that I don't even realize I said. But just in this one now, so my brain is looking for these quotes. You've said like 10 of them and I'm going to send them to you because you need to have your picture with these quotes on them because I will not participate in failure is the truth. And by the way, you know, Aaron, you are, um, you know, I sat in a room with you one time, um, I think a couple of times now where we were doing licensing at the end, you know, it's usually around this time of year that we're doing our licensing together. I know. We, we did, and, I know. Uh, and I'll look around the room and then I'll see you. And I'm like, you know, you catch my eye because you're wearing your cap, got the beard, slouched in the chair. No one would ever know the amount of knowledge you just dropped and how important it is to the industry to have somebody like you that's helping investors really, you know, vie for success in, in the in the route that they want to be in. So I wanted to give you an opportunity to tell, you know, the people that are going to watch this now and later, um, how does somebody get a hold of you? How do investors get a hold of you? If they if they want a consultation on how to leverage, you know, financing so that they can go out and build wealth. Well, let's go to AaronBChapman.com. You know, AaronChapman.com works as well. That one works. In fact, if you just Google Aaron Chapman, feel free to take a look. I don't know how it happened. I've just been on the internet just in the last year and six months. I have not had nothing out there before <laughs> that. The first two pages are just me. It used to be a soccer player and another author, another author. Those guys have been pushed to the third page. Now, on the picture oh. section, the soccer player is still kicking my ass, but I have not tried to do that. So if you just Google Aaron Chapman, you'll see all my stuff in its podcasts and my website. So and you can go to you know check out my NMLS ID and make sure I haven't been uh, you know two six seven eight four four that I haven't been uh, you know complained about. But I appreciate what you said about looking across the room in that auditorium with all those loan originators there. There's a, there's some boisterous people that come in there, pound their chest. I'm the freaking man. I got my I got my bright colored pastel freaking suit on and you know no spot <laughs> my pointy ass shoes and shit. I'm like. All right, dude, you go do you, you know, which I'm glad there's people that need to be like that because that way I know that nobody's going to be sitting in my hunting spot or in my tree stand. I know they're out the golf course, so I know that I'm not getting inter interrupted. But when you think about what you just said, it's like people need to walk around with quiet, quiet power in reality. You know, the noisier you are, if you're going to walk around trying to be the man, it, it's, they're going to discount you. That's the most discounted mm -hmm. person in the room. It's the individual, yeah. and I've always noticed that the guy who's quiet and just sitting there watching, you can see the wheels turn their head. There's a lot of knowledge to be gained from that person. And usually it's somebody older, and it's not going to offer anything easily. you got to know that, that the other person is very mm -hmm. interested in hearing it before they're going to drop mm -hmm. that on. And, um, and the other thing is, guys, be unassuming. Don't walk around flaunting all your stuff. Nobody, I don't want anybody to ever know what I make or what I'm worth or any of that kind of stuff. In fact, I had made the mistake of showing my kids one time. And it wasn't a mistake because I'm educating my kids on our investments. They have to vote on our investments. And when I showed their, shared with them what my income was, they're like, 
Why do we live here, Dad? Like, because you're not. <laughs> You're not going to have any better childhood than I had. You know, later on in life, I'll have a castle <laughs> on the hill and you come to visit we'll meet at Circle K. You'll put on a hood and then I'll take you up there. But yeah, when it comes to it is like, you know, people that walk around flaunting it. Come on, guys. You know, yeah. you, if a person, you know, they, they have to look closely to notice anything about um, anything that I might be wearing that might have some sort of extreme um, cost to it. Well, you know, there's a there's a quote um, from. Uh, the ghetto boys it's a song um and it's uh, they say uh i'm gonna i'm gonna say the clean version of it but it says real gangsters don't flex because real gangsters know they got it you know and 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 that's it you, you, there's no flexing here right you just you'll sit in the room you're you're just watching the room watching what's going on and no one would know from the outside looking in the amount of knowledge that you have to help them leverage and so man i gotta tell you aaron thank you so much for doing this for anybody who wants to hear more of aaron's story um we dropped the podcast today it's on apple and spotify i'll put it in the comments um or go to my feed and you'll see it go to his feed he'll see it but we are uh we hope that you guys check it out reach out to aaron if you have any questions on leveraging financing uh needs um, and look at his YouTube page and also go to Amazon and search his name because he has an amazing book series that's out. And Aaron, thank you, man, so much for doing this because it means a lot to me. And I I, I feel like I know you far better than I did, um, you know, several weeks ago before we started this process of getting to know each other. But I cannot wait to do yours with you. And um, I hope that we get to, you know, continue to share stories, man, in the future. So thank you for doing this. It's definitely going to be that way, guys. And and thank you, man. I appreciate you letting me on here. And I can't fit, wait to get you around the fire. And if you guys have a hard time on Amazon, you can find the QJO initiative book as in the Quit Jerking Off initiative is what the book series is on Barnes and Noble because they, they haven't sold out of there, it looks like. And uh, yeah. yeah. And one last thing, everybody, is like just know when you want to throw things at people and drop knowledge on them if you have it. If people don't ask, they can't hear the answer. People have to ask the question first. You just don't start bleeding on somebody unless they ask the question. So. I love it, man. I love it. Thank you, Aaron. Absolutely. I really appreciate it, man. I hope you crush this month. I hope you hit all your goals. And here's to the rest of 2020, man. It's been a tough year, but I know it's probably going to be your best year in the, in the industry. So take care, man, and we'll be talking to you soon. Thanks, buddy. All right, brother. Bye-bye.